Okay, hi everyone. I'm Philip. Let's get started. I hope everybody can see me. I cannot unfortunately see you, but if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm having a slider open on a second screen so we can keep going. So let's dive a bit into containers to Kubernetes operators and we will start with some best practices around containers and then work our way up through all the way to operators. Why am I talking about that? I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Kibana, Beats, Logstash. You might have heard of us, you might be using us for logging or some full text search use case. Um, that's how we produce a lot of containers and many people are consuming our containers. And this story today is a bit about how to consume those or how we build them and see them and what maybe you can learn from us or maybe you want to share with us that we should do differently because we're always looking for feedback as well. So this is our stack if you've never seen it, though it doesn't really matter. I will mostly focus on Elasticsearch for today. So let's dive into that. Again, if you have any questions or comments, I have on the side on the second screen Slido open. So if you could head to slido.com and then DevOps uh, 2020, that's where you can pop in on hall one the questions and I will just see them and will try to react accordingly, more or less live. So let's take this away. Who uses containers? Which is almost a stupid question in 2020 because I assume that most of you, if not all of you, are using containers in some way already. What is probably less or fewer of you is who are using containers in production. That's normally a smaller number, but many people still do. What is still then interesting is how many people are using stateful containers. So stateful containers are something like you have a data store that keeps state and you keep that in a container. Because state is always a bit tricky, running stateless stuff like your applications that you can just reboot or replace easily, that's much simpler than keeping state in containers. And what I'm talking about today will mostly be around stateful containers. So if I cover some trade-offs, it's normally in the context of having a stateful container. Just keep that in mind. Is anybody using our containers? If yes, let me know or let me know if you're not happy can discuss why we do something in particular. But let me walk you through my talk and then you will see how this is going. So like I said, I want to start a bit with best practices and some worst practices in containers at first. Then very shortly Docker Compose and where it fits in and then we'll move on to Kubernetes and with that Helm charts and operators in specific. So let's dive into that. Docker or, okay, I already can see questions. I'll come back to them later on um, because they're not where we want to have them right now. I'll get, I'll get back to your questions in a bit. Um, so Docker is probably what everybody is running. And by the way, I think the right logo for Docker would be this one. And let me uh, change this one to full screen here. This is probably what many of your containers look like. This is also the size of your average container nowadays, um, which probably quite a large one. Um, internally at Elastic, we have this Docker is the world's most heavily funded college project, which was especially to like, through like two or three years ago when it was breaking a lot of APIs and it was still a bit more painful to use than it is today. Things have improved since then, it's more mainstream, um, but every now and then you stumble over fun stuff. We'll get into some fun stuff as we go along. But there is no way around it or denying is that Docker containers are like the new zip format. So zip format used to be for 20 years or so the way you often consume software. And I think it's fair to say that Docker containers are the way how many of us are consuming software nowadays. So there is no way around them. But at least from our perspective, they're just one way of many how to run containers. So if you still want to run on a Debian or RPM package, that's fine. There is nothing bad about that. We wouldn't mandate running anything on Docker. It's just one of many ways to get your software. It's just kind of a fancy way that people want to use nowadays. But if you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. It's just one of many ways. Um, but obviously it's not without issues to those you will run every now and then. So the first issue that we see every now and then is that people want to run everything 
thing as root and don't care about it at all. I'm not going to ask who is doing that or who doesn't care about that because it's not the best thing. There is this fun comic where you could now replace the snake with a whale. So you can see the set line on, on top uh, where we replace the snake with a whale. This is what many people are basically doing in there. And our containers are a bit stricter around that. So we basically mandate that you use a specific user, Elasticsearch, and then use a specific user ID and group ID to own the data directory, for example. So if you just create that with root, it will not start because the permissions don't match. And that confuses people sometimes because not every container out there follows this best practice. Sometimes people get very confused and open an issue around that. And an issue could look something like this. You don't need to read all of this. The highlight here is that somebody prefers a simple fire and forget Docker container. And whenever we read that, especially for anything where you have data in there and you probably don't want to lose the data, what we implicitly hear there is you probably run your application something like this. So you don't really care what you do with your data. And that's not really where we want to be. Um, let me switch over to this view here now. Um, the next fallacy that we see every now and then that people do is you do some host mutation. So your container changes something, maybe some permissions in a bind mounted directory on the host, which again is not a good idea because whatever a container does should be confined to the container. It's nice that you try to fix stuff, but maybe you actually make it worse than what you were expecting. Um, and that leads us to this very nice quote that those who do not understand Unix are condemned to reinvent it, but poorly. And you see that every now and then the people who have never used Unix and don't know much about file permissions can be very confused about that. Because unfortunately, there are still some Unix primitives or not unfortunately, there are Unix primitives in containers. And you will need to know about them. Otherwise, you will always keep fighting them and things will not work out exactly the way you were expecting them to. Um, another problem that we see quite frequently is latest. Is anybody using latest on containers they are using from somebody else? If you build latest containers and you use them yourself, you have control over them. So that's probably fine. If that is a good or a bad practice, we could discuss, but that's even more complicated, let's keep it simple. Using latest from somebody else is probably not what you want because it might very easily break your own dependencies. There's a reason why in many dependency management systems, you cannot just say, oh, I want the latest dependency, but you need to specify the actual dependency. And that's pretty much what you would get with latest again. And unfortunately, Docker and especially Docker Hub are almost promoting that. Um, so if you go to Docker Hub and go to any project there, like the Elasticsearch containers that are up there, the one command that they recommend or have here is a Docker pull Elasticsearch, which implicitly means that this is latest here. Does anybody know what happens if you copy that command and try to run it? It will error. Why? Because we don't have latest because we strongly believe that latest is something that you should not provide. And the reason why is how that would look like is today you start a container or a setup with three Docker containers and you have three nodes and those are in whatever is the latest version today. So seven, six, one as of today. And in a year or so, you might need more capacity. And then on top of your existing three nodes, you want to add let's say two more nodes and you use latest again and probably you're getting a new major version there and you might break your cluster in a very weird or unexpected way because new major version breaking changes and that's really not what you want that's why we basically force anybody using our containers to specify the version number explicitly which is a little more work up front today but will ensure that you don't weirdly break your clusters later on because our containers are made for production. Of course, you can use them for development as well. But if there is a question if we should optimize for production or development, we would always go for production. 
can you use like major or minor version where you just pin to that? So for example, you could say the major version is seven. And if you specify that, there shouldn't be any breaking changes because it's specified down to the major version, right? Or you could just say, oh, I even want to specify that for a specific minor version. So I'm just wanting to get my containers on 7.5 and I don't care what the patch level release is. Do we support that? Anybody knows? No, we don't. Because also that might lead to slightly weird behaviors of your cluster. So for example, if you create some so-called shards, the things that make up the data that you store in Elasticsearch, and one is created with some version and then you have nodes with a slightly older version. So let's assume you create a new shard with 7.6 and then you still have nodes running on 7.1 and there is a different Apache Lucene library in there, which is the base library storing the actual data and kind of like the internal library we build on top of. If those are different, there might be scenarios where you're shards could not migrate to one of these older nodes because they were created in a newer version or with a newer version and they don't want to move to an older version. And then your cluster might get imbalanced and it might be weird to debug and you might get very unhappy if your cluster is suddenly running over on some nodes and cannot move the data to other nodes. So we don't support that at all. You need to specify down to the patch level version the right version. Another thing that we see more or less frequently is people want runtime mutation, which once you have worked for a while with Docker containers, feels kind of weird. So when I say runtime mutation, I mean something like this. People want to provide a shell script and then something happens in the container. Or you set an environment variable and something happens because of that. And those are not the ways how that should be done. What would be the better way to do that? Obviously, you use a Docker file, you create that image with whatever plugins you want or dependencies that you want. You push that to your own or a public registry and then you always use this image because that's one final static image and you're not doing anything when you start it up. The problem here is especially, let's assume you have three nodes again. You run some shell script to install plugins, for example. And that works on two nodes and on the third node for some reason the network connection fails and you don't get that plugin and suddenly you have different docker containers running that might create data differently because you're missing a plugin and that's very unexpected so that's another thing that we try to avoid at all costs so the right way to do that would be a docker file here you can just see okay we're using whatever elasticsearch base tag we have and then we install plugins into that once you build that, you push it, and then you can just consume from that. Or for example, if you want to generate a key store or a certificate, where would you put those? And here, probably you shouldn't put them into the image. Why? Because anything that is a secret or a certificate has probably a different life cycle than the rest of your setup. Because maybe you want to rotate the password or a a TLL, TLS certificate is expiring and you need to replace that. But you don't want to replace your entire version or Docker image because of that. So those you would generally bind mount. What this slide is basically doing is I'm just running one single node to generate a key store that keeps some uh, secrets. So here I'm just keeping a test secret, which is a bit useless, but this is how you would specify some password or some other secret um, that you could use and then you would bind mount that. So a secret you wouldn't bake into the container because it just has a different life cycle than your general images. Um, you would just mount them and reuse them and replace them because, well, different life cycle. So those you don't bake in, but plugins, for example, you would always bake into the image. Another fallacy or thing that is up for discussion are base images. Some people have very strong opinions around base images and we don't really because we're a bit more on the pragmatic side. By now, all our images are based on CentOS 7. We used to have, for example, Alpine-based Elasticsearch instances, but we were running into various issues and we kind of decided that it's not worth the hassle. Also, all our containers use the same base image so we can share the layers. So, the upside of using CentOS for everything is 
It is a similar setup for all the containers. We can share the layers. Also, most of the customers are in the US and they often prefer something Red Hat based. Another thing is the JVM is generally large anyway. So even if you have a very small base layer, once you install the JVM, it's not going to be tiny or that tiny anymore. And while glibc is kind of old and not that nice maybe, it is very battle tested. So with MuCL in Alpine, we ran into various issues just because people haven't tried out all the scenarios or all the things. Like I remember we had issues like if you had more than three layers and were running on Windows, then you would run into some problem when you would mount something. Um, so we ran into more issues there than was really worth it in our opinion. Also, since it's Red Hat based, we generally trust Red Hat more than many other distributors or distributions because the Red Hat folks are heavily invested in the Java ecosystem. So they generally know very well what they're doing around the JVM. And we trust them more doing the right thing than we would, for example, the Debian folks who sometimes break stuff in a very weird way in their images. So that's how we ended up with CentOS. It of course has some downsides and the main downside is size because the images are like I've shown you initially with the whale, not super small, which is maybe an understatement. Um, there are hundreds of megabytes, which is not super small, but in our opinion, this is less of an issue here than with other images, mostly because you have a stateful image and you probably have a lot of data on top of that. Do you really care about if you have 800 or 200 megabytes in the base image, if you keep 500 gigabytes of data on that? Probably not so much. Also, this is not a stateless service that you roll out and deploy 20 times a day. We only release every couple of weeks normally. So you will not very frequently deploy those images. And generally data stores, you probably don't touch that often anyway. So we don't think that the size is that much of an issue, neither disk wise, because you will keep much more data on them, nor the network, because you won't deploy that X times a day. We simply don't have that many releases. I get the pain point that if you have a development system and there you have many different containers and they eat up a lot of space, it might be slightly painful. On the other hand, since we share all the layers, it should kind of like be like the problem should be limited because of that, because we share all those layers. Um, and like I said, does it really matter? I get the size argument totally for a stateless image where you might deploy very frequently, but for stateful, especially when you keep a lot of data on it, we don't think that the size is the number one thing that you want to worry about. Probably you care more about stability and we think CentOS is striking a good balance there. Though we are looking into smaller images, mostly because for security alerts, because there is something in the image, it's not exploitable, but it's in the image and a security scanner or an automated security scanner might find it is kind of a pain point. And we got a lot of reports that people say like, oh, there's something in your containers that might be a problem. And we're like, no, for these reasons, it's not, but this adds a lot of overhead for us. So that's why we're looking into smaller images now as well. And we'll see how we can get there. Sometimes people ask for windows based images. Anybody feels like that? I get the argument because on newer server versions of Windows, then you can skip that small VM layer in the middle because I think then uh, a Windows container can run natively on a Windows host if you have a new enough version. But on our team, very few people have Windows experience, so we don't really want to touch that. Also, normally when I ask, very few people are actually using Windows based images. Okay, next up, Doc Compose. Probably you're using Docker Compose already, but I would assume that most of you just use it for development or demos where it's nice. It's very easy to get started. For example, I run a lot of my demos on Docker Compose because it just a Docker Compose up away and it will just run and it's not full orchestration, but it gets you started quite easily. Um, here, for example, this would be the minimal setup that you could run. Um, around one Elasticsearch instance, a very small one, plus one Kibana instance to talk to it. We have a mind mounted directory where we keep the data, which is generally how you should do it. And this is the minimal setup that I could use to run an Elasticsearch demo. It's not across multiple nodes. It doesn't really give you high availability. So this is mostly a demo setup. 
but it works for that. We did have, or you can still get the code, a so-called stack docker repository where we started lots of our images to run one demo, but we have kind of deprecated that or we have just deprecated it this week, actually, I think, um, because people are moving away from Docker Compose and we are trying to either position our cloud service or get people on Kubernetes where we invest much more time on. So moving on to that, Kubernetes is probably what lots of you are using already or want to use. Normally when I ask like who is using Kubernetes and it's then like 20 or 30% of the people. And then you can also ask like, what is or why do you want to use Kubernetes? What is the actual question? And nobody cares anymore. It's just about the usage of Kubernetes. When you ask the same thing about like who is using Swarm, probably not that many. Sometimes for legacy reasons, people are still on Swarm. Who is using Nomad from HashiCorp? Also normally very few. Mesosphere, anybody still? Probably not. Um, so what you get with Kubernetes is set the configuration and you can deploy config, uh, resources to Kubernetes with that. And that looks something like this. I'm pretty sure you have all seen that one many times. Um, the main question in here is how to pronounce this. If it's kubectl, kubectl or whatever other variation of pronunciation you want to use. Doesn't really matter in the end. You have an API server that you can talk to. It stores its state in etcd. Um, it has a controller and a scheduler, and then you have the kubelets running on the actual nodes doing the work. I'm pretty sure you have seen this. Um, what do you get lots of here is YAML, which normally leads me to the question like, who likes writing YAML? And everybody who says yes now, I'm kind of thinking that this is the Stockholm syndrome, that you get so used to writing YAML that at some point you like it because you spend all your days writing YAML. And the YAML has, besides having too much of it, has some other interesting properties or problems that you might run into. Um, let's take a look. This is actually from the Docker docs. So if you run this, you want to do a port mapping. You want to map port 80 from the container on 80 on the host and 20 to 20. If you run this through a YAML linter, does anybody know what will happen here? And this, by the way, breaks in an unexpected way and running it through the YAML linter, you will actually see what is going wrong here. Any guesses? So what you get is this. And you can see the port mapping 80 to 80 is working fine. But 20 to 20 is falling apart totally. And you get a very high number here. Anybody knows why? Because YAML has this fine attribute if you have colon, whatever, and that whatever is lower than 60, it will be interpreted as the base. So rather than having base 10, my number here will be interpreted as a base 20. And then you end up with this big number. Probably not what you wanted. Um, also, something that people run into every now and then, it's like you have a list of countries, for example. So you have LT and DE and AT for Austria or whatever other countries you have. And then you add Norway, which is NO, and that will be evaluated to false. And this is one of, I think, 13 or so ways to write a truthy or falsy value in YAML. And this is just unnecessary um, and makes it much easier to fail than you would have to. So be careful around that. The one problem we had with Kubernetes was that up until 1.8, which was admittedly a long time ago, no dots were allowed in environment variables for no obvious reason, but Kubernetes just didn't support that, but they did fix that in an issue a while ago. So since then you can run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. But you probably don't want to do that manually because all the YAML. You maybe want to use Helm. So Helm charts, if you've never heard or seen them, are a package manager and you can use templating. So what that might be is you still think in Kubernetes primitives, this is kind of the nice thing about them, is that you don't need get any new concepts. Like you still have your stateful set and your service and your deployment but you get that packaged in a so-called 
more or less a package manager to install something. So what hand charts are, you can then say like, spin up a cluster with three nodes um, and that much RAM and this much disk, and it will just do that. And it's like a package manager, it will install that. Or you could also run the command and say like, please upgrade this from 7.3 to 7.5. And then with hand charts, you can just run that upgrade operation. And we built those hand charts. We support Elasticsearch itself, Kibana and FileBeat and MetricBeat. And you can use those to roll out those components. It's still better at the moment, but we use that internally quite a bit already. So you should have good results with those. Generally, where you keep your data, because like I said, focusing on stateful data loads is kind of the main question here. So stateful set is where we keep the data. Those allow you to have a rolling upgrade. So when we run from 7.3 to 7.5, for example, um, you will always take out one node of the cluster, bump the image to the latest version, reattach the volume. Once that can join the cluster again, your cluster state will go back to green and then you can go back to the next node and roll that over. And with stateful sets, you don't have to replicate a lot of data around, you will just reattach volumes. This works. Um, this is kind of the best practice of how to do things. We mostly test this on GKE for now, um, but other platforms are also supported. The thing about Helm charts is that they are unopinionated. So you generally stick to what you know from Docker. You bind mount your secrets, you bind mount the, the TLS certificates that you generate yourself. There are multiple upgrade strategies. Basically, we don't have much operational knowledge implemented into those. It's more like you have the templates and how to install or move something from one state to the next, but it doesn't have like operational best practice, how to run a cluster really built in, but that gives you more choice. So if you want to run something in a specific way, the hand charts give you more or a better handle to do things the way you expect them to work. Um, here's a very simple example picked up from uh, our docs. So here I'm adding our Helm repository. I can set the specific version I want to run. So for example, 7.5.2. Then on Minikube, you would need to enable two storage providers and then you can jump to the Minikube example directory and we use make to roll those out. What my configuration template here actually looks like is I set a very small heap of 128 uh, megs. And then I set some quotas of how much capacity do I give my Elasticsearch instance and what is the volume claim and all of those are really tiny demo values so 100 megabytes to write data for Elasticsearch is not a lot normally you will have a lot. what is also relevant here if you run on minikube and everything runs on one single physical node you need to set affinity to soft so that we will actually allocate multiple nodes on the same physical machine which for a highly available setup you probably wouldn't want to have you would want to have different machines. But what many people want to have is a bit more power. And this is where the operator framework comes in. And this extends the Kubernetes interfaces and basically allows you to write your own custom applications. And what you get is basically rather than thinking in pods and services and like Kubernetes primitives, you can think in terms of the service that you want to run. So in our example, you think of an Elasticsearch service and Kibana service and APM service. Those are the so-called custom resource definitions and you can define them and extend the interfaces that you have in Kubernetes. By the way, it's something where I'm sometimes a bit sloppy, so please excuse me for that. Um, you have the custom resource definition. This is, if you're coming from an object-oriented object background, this is like the class definition. This defines the type. And then you have a custom resource. This is like the instance. So one defines of what is possible and what you can have, and the other one is the concrete instance. And generally, I will actually mean custom resources, where this is the custom resource of the specific instance that we are generating and using, just to keep those two clear and separate. How you bring a custom resource definition to life is with a so-called custom controller. 
And that one runs basically in an endless loop, the so-called reconciliation loop. And it will basically continuously check what have you configured and what is the state of your cluster right now. And if the, same, the two don't match, it will try to bring your deployment into that state that you want to have. And it runs continuously. So if, for example, one node dies and you configure that you want to have three Elasticsearch nodes, one died, the reconciliation loop will figure that out and start up a new node and that will join the cluster. Whereas with health charts, that will just run whenever you run the command. So you set up three nodes, but it would not continuously check, are there really three nodes running? Because once you have set it up, the health chart would just stop or wouldn't have anything else to do. It doesn't have this reconciliation loop in the background. And the way that is implemented is you normally write code. So in our example, go. And this has a lot of operational or can have a lot of operational best practices built in. So for example, for our operator, we have built in like, how do you handle upgrades? And there is a single upgrade strategy. How do you handle secrets? We will automatically generate TLS certificates for you. Um, how do you set up, oh, sorry, the, the certificate management part. Secrets, like we would automatically generate passwords and set those, and then you would need to extract them unless you have set explicit values. So there is, or there are these best practices that we do set automatically for you, but you don't have to worry about those then anymore. So this is kind of the trade of where we're operating here. And there used to be an operator from the community, but they don't have time for that anymore and stop that. So we thought, well, we'll, we'll pick that up. This is the logo that we picked for it on this repository here. And it supports Elasticsearch, Kibana, and the APM server. So all the server components basically that we have right now, but we're adding or we're about to add a few more there. One thing that is sometimes slightly confusing is that the repository is not called operator, but it's called cloud on Kubernetes because the vision have like a cloud-like experience there with a management UI and quite a few other things that are still in the making. Um, but that's why it's not called an operator. Don't be confused by that. If you're looking for an operator, it's cloud on Kubernetes is what you're looking for. Um, our operator is built on Golang 113. We are using Cube Builder, which is basically the SDK for interacting with the Kubernetes API um, to work with those custom resource definitions. And then we use customize to generate patched CRDs. So for example, very old version of Kubernetes and we're missing some features that we would expect on use otherwise, we can patch up the CRDs to actually work with those very old versions still. How are we doing timing wise? Are oh, we still got plenty of time? So this is a schematic or a schema of how an operator looks like. So we as the operator deploy that operator here and it has that color and the custom resource definitions that you can run. And then we actually create the actual custom resource. So for example, Elasticsearch and Kibana, we specify that the operator picks up the configuration that we have configured and then creates our cluster according to those specifications that we have provided. And like I said, that reconciliation, reconciliation loop will continuously check what is configured here. Set the state that we have, if not, try to move it to whatever we have configured here. And it will do that forever. And like I said, it is opinionated. So this has operational best practices built in. Um, it knows how to handle a lot of things for you. Code, we have a lot of power over that. Um, so for example, if we scale down, if you have five nodes and you want to scale down to three Elasticsearch nodes, it would first drain the data, basically move the data from two of the nodes to the remaining three. And only once there is no data left on those two nodes, it would shut them down. That would be built in. Or for example, when you do an upgrade, there's the so-called chart uh, allocation that if a node goes down, it would try to replace the missing replication. Um, we would disable that in an upgrade scenario because we know the node will come back once it's upgraded and it would be pointless to try data in the meantime. So those are things that are built in and you don't need to explicitly configure them anymore. You can still shoot yourself in the foot. For example, if you configure zero replicas, so you have a single copy of your data, 
and you do a rolling upgrade. If the node with the single copy of that data goes down for being for replacement with a newer version, that data won't be available. So it's not a guarantee that everything will always work. You will still need to understand how it's set up and what is being done for you and what isn't. Quick example of how to run this on Minikube. Give it enough memory, um, give it enough CPU, start Minikube. Then you can download the current version, um, the all-in-one YAML of the operator. You can watch it come up and then you can deploy whatever configuration you define in that APM Elasticsearch and Kibana. The following three slides will show you how you could configure that. So that is, this file here is over the next three slides. So what I've defined here is rather than having some Kubernetes this concept here, the kind here is Elasticsearch. And you can see here, this is the API, API version. Oh, and by the way, this is not a better anymore. This is a stable, a stable version. I will need to update that slide. So here you can see now, rather than thinking in Kubernetes primitive, we are thinking in Elasticsearch service kind API versions. My cluster is called Elasticsearch sample. Um, and this is the version that I'm running this on and I set a two gigabyte limit to the single node that I'm running and I'm setting a template of where I keep the storage, how much storage I had. The same here happens for the APM server. So we're thinking in terms of enough. and how to link that is here, the Elasticsearch sample that was the reference to Elasticsearch in the previous slide that we wanted to connect to. Same then for Kibana. Three. Um, you can just get the three nodes that you're trying to start. You would, for example, expose Kibana so you can actually interact with Kibana on that port. Since we generate the password automatically for you, we never specified that. You will need to use this final command here to actually fetch that password that we have automatically generated for you. So the username will be elastic and then some randomly generated password and you can just fetch that. Your cluster will always be secured but you need to get the password to actually interact with it. Okay, if you want to change anything, change it in the YAML file and then apply that through kubectl, the reconciliation loop will pick it up, bring your cluster to the new state and you're good to go. This is widely tested and you can just run it on any of these cloud providers. Again, we're using stateful sets to reattach volumes for rolling upgrades. Um, this will just work. Um, generally, where to keep your data, we would recommend persistent volumes, um, either local persistent volumes or if you're on a cloud provider, they normally provide some mechanism there like EBS on AWS or the other cloud providers have similar concepts. You could also use um, host path, which is ephemeral. Um, so if you are using it more like a cache and you can always recreate your data easily, that might be an option, but it will be far less common. In the future, we might provide our own container storage interface. Um, it's another Kubernetes concept uh, that you can hook into to provide a way to attach or work with storage. Um, maybe we'll dive into that, but we're a bit unsure about that yet. Um, the one thing that you will need quite a lot of are permissions to actually run CRDs. And right now our containers are doing something here with the operator that maybe you shouldn't do is the max map Count, we set that for or on your host. So you don't have to do that manually. But like I said, at the very beginning, your containers should never change anything on the host. So maybe this is actually not the, the right practice and we should, or we might change it over time. Um, there are two ways to run this actually, like with a global namespace. So here we have an elastic system namespace and the operator runs once in that namespace and manages all the other namespaces and tries to figure out, did you configure any Elasticsearch resources there? Then I will manage them. Or the alternative is you can use the same namespace for your operator and the cluster that you're running this in. So every team here now has a namespace and every team is running their own operator. And this is a trade-off between here, you have you protected your system a bit better because even when somebody deletes whatever they want in their custom namespace, they will never impact the operator. And you only have this one here running, even though that will only take like, I don't know, 100 or 200 megs of RAM. 
you only have this running once, whereas here you might have, or you will have them running multiple times. The nice thing here is you don't need any global privileges to install it, and people can run different versions of the operator if they want to. It's up to them. So these are the two deployment models that you can use. There are plenty of other operators. There's Operator Hub where you can see what other operators are out there and you can just pick the ones that you want. Some of them behave a bit differently because, well, it's code and everybody implements their own best practices. So you will need to figure out who is doing what. So to wrap this up, sometimes people are saying containers are disrupting the industry and I'm never sure if that's meant in a positive or a negative way or disrupting is more like bringing or taking stuff down. The common question then that people have is, can I run Elasticsearch on Docker or Kubernetes? Which yes, you can, but this is not the right question. The question that you should be asking is, should I be doing that? What is the answer to that? It depends. That's the regular answer for most of these questions. If you run all of your other workloads on Kubernetes or Docker and you know how to handle that, go wild, we have the operator, we have the hand charts, use that. If you're not using Kubernetes yet, probably don't start with your stateful services. It might just add unnecessary complexity. Um, I would recommend to actually start with the stateless service and build up your confidence there. And then there's one final thing that we see every now and then, and I call that the Kubernetes paradox, um, is when you come somewhere and then they ask you, do you have a Kubernetes strategy? And when we said like, no, we don't have an operator, like we don't have a Kubernetes strategy, they will be like, okay, this is a blocker. We cannot use your software at all. And then once that changed and we tell people, well, we have an operator now, um, and you ask, okay, so you're going to use the operator because you run everything on Kubernetes. And then people will often say like, well, actually we're just, trying this out, like 2% of our workloads are on Kubernetes. Um, so while many people really want the operator, we have production users, but not that many are actually running things in production on Kubernetes, especially for stateful workloads, which is kind of a fun paradox on that we saw a couple of times. For hand charts versus operators, it's mostly about this being flexible versus being opinionated and having the operational best practices built in and you will need to pick whatever you want. If you run lots and lots of different uh, orchestrated things, maybe the hand charts are easier for you because you can just run them the way you want to versus the operator is much more strict than doing it one specific way. If that doesn't align with you, it's a bit tough, but well, those are the best practices that we think are right to run. So let me head over to the questions. I see that we have Quite a few questions here and I still have two or three minutes left so let me dive into those. If you have more just throw them in here and I will tweet out, this is my Twitter handle, I will tweet out the answers to any remaining questions. Also if you want to get the slides this is the page where you can get the slides, this is the QR code for the slides. So I'll just go through them uh, from the top. I have a Dockerized application that has a hierarchical config folder containing JSON files that I attach as a volume when running a container. I guess this is more of a comment or I'm, I'm not really seeing the question there. So, okay, yes, if you have hierarchical config folder, um, if you map that correctly to whatever your data store is using and picking it up, do that. Um, and you face that when running this in Kubernetes. I'm and then we go on. Okay, this is the same question going on to hard code config folder into an image is not an option. Well, you don't have to hard code any any configs in there. It it really depends. Like plugins, you would hard code because you always want to have them. Configurations. Um, you might, but also, for example, Elasticsearch has a cluster API. So a lot of the configurations you would actually apply through the API at a later point and not bake them into the image. How much you want to bake into the image, maybe for different environments, you want to have a new top layer of your images and have different configurations, maybe, or you run it through the API, but I would need to see an example to see how that is going. Um, next question is, 
What way do you recommend to run multiple environments using Helm? How should we... And my questions keep jumping around here. Um, how should we inject uh, secrets? Um, well, the, the secrets, the, the, you, you can just in, inject with Kubernetes primitives, uh, like you have the config map, and in the config map, you just map whatever uh, secrets you have map to Kubernetes. So you can just rely on the Kubernetes primitives for the secrets there. Um, question, will there be an ECK operator Helm chart? That's actually a good question, probably. So that is a Helm chart to roll out the operator. We haven't written that one yet, but probably we'll get to that. Um, Yeah, this is the question I've already answered. Um, let me do one final question because I think we're running short on time as well. Uh, when is a good use case? When is good to use custom created Helm charts in hosted Helm repo for frequent deployments? If you have to provide multiple change parameters for each run, I'm not sure I fully understand the question since. Well, you have control over the templates and you can template whatever you want. You can parameterize, parameterize that with the Helm charts. So I think you can go pretty wild on that and I wouldn't see any limitations on that. Rancher in, in enterprise environments. Um, I haven't seen Rancher that much. I assume we're talking about Rancher 2, which is based on Kubernetes and not Rancher 1. Um, maybe it's making your life easier. Um, I mostly see OpenShift to be honest, but maybe Rancher has a shot there as well. If you think that's the right environment, sure, why not? Like I said, we are not super opinionated on how you run this. We provide the images and the orchestration to some extent, but if you think like Rancher is the right way to run something, go out there. And I think with that, we're out of time. Thanks a lot for joining. If you have any more questions, just send me a tweet along and otherwise I will do the closing keynote tonight. So hope to see you later. Thanks and bye.